Today we're going to transition into Aristotle's virtue ethics. Aristotle was an ancient Greek philosopher. He was a student of Plato. Remember, Plato is a student of Socrates. If you took a ethics course uh, a few decades ago or even a hundred years ago, you most likely would have studied some of the utilitarian theories that we looked at from John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. You probably would have looked at Kant's ethics, but you might not have gotten a dose of Aristotle's virtue ethics. It came back into fashion in the last century because of the work of Philip Foot. So now in many ethics courses, you will look at Kant's ethics, Mill's ethics, and Aristotle's ethics. And these are considered to be two or three of the major theories, the most popular, the, the theories that get the most support among contemporary philosophers. And it says there, ethics of character. So that's gonna be the focus here, developing one's character. Both Mill and Kant were after what we called a procedural principle. So whether it be the principle of utility or the categorical imperative, we're looking at moral principles that help us what to help us figure out what should we do whenever we face a moral dilemma? Is there some kind of procedure or systematic um, mechanism that we can appeal to to figure out what right and wrong are? A procedural principle helps us answer the question, what should I do? Aristotle was less interested in this sort of question and more interested in this question, what kind of person should I be? And he focused on character traits instead of emphasizing a be-all, end-all procedural principle that will solve most, if not all, ethical dilemmas. So I mentioned Aristotle, ancient Greek philosopher, lived in the 300s before the Common Era, ancient Greek philosopher, of course, again, student of Plato. Uh, Aristotle was a student of Plato, and Plato is a student of Socrates. Interestingly, if you are familiar with Alexander the Great from your history courses, Aristotle was a hired tutor for Alexander the Great. And the work that we are going to investigate today is from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Sometimes it's pronounced Nicomachean. Um, we aren't quite sure exactly how to pronounce some of these Greek words because they're so old. So I'll say Nicomachean, but you also get Nicomachean. And here's uh, an image of a statue of Aristotle. This is what he might have looked like. The focus of Aristotle's ethics are virtues. The Greek term for virtue is erite. Erite is a character trait manifested in habitual action that lies on a mean between two extremes. So the virtue is the midpoint, the point of balance between two extremes, and on either extreme there are vices. So for instance, courage, which was a virtue for Aristotle, that's the center midpoint that we should strive for. But you can, as it were, have too much or have too little. And if you go to one extreme of this character trait, you are foolhardy or foolish. If you don't have enough courage, you're cowardly. Or take honesty. Honesty is a good thing, but if you're too forthright, you might up end up, you might end up being boastful, bragging. Or you might be uh, revealing things that uh, you shouldn't be revealing. It's good to be truthful, but that doesn't mean that you have to um, you have to convey every truth that's that's in your mind. And then if you aren't honest enough, you're just a liar, or maybe you're being too modest. 
So you see how courage and honesty, they're the midpoint. And then you could have too much or too little. Too much courage, you are foolish. You know, that's like uh, a soldier running in the middle of the battlefield alone because they're so courageous. That's just that's them being foolish. And then versus the soldier who won't even step on the batter, battlefield because they don't have enough courage. But courage doesn't have to be something that it's done in a military sense. Courage could be, um, you know, um, a woman uh, fighting for women's rights, for, for, uh, for suffrage in the early 20th century, having the courage uh, in that case. So it doesn't have to be um, the traditional brave soldier sense of courage. Here are some other Greek terms that I'm going to hold you responsible for. So we've got erite, which means virtue, which is a character trait manifested in a habitual action. So it's something you've got to practice. Another one is telos, which is the Greek word for end or purpose or goal. Our purpose, the reason why we're here, at least for Aristotle, is something called eudaimonia, sometimes pronounced eudaimonia, which it's difficult to translate. There's different interpretations. One of them is flourishing or thriving or even well-being. Maybe it's the good life. Or you can think of it as a profound, sustained, or sustaining happiness. So this is why we're here. We're here to be the best that we can be. Our telos is determined by our function, which is ergon. The ergon of a human being is activity of the soul in accordance with reason. So we have telos, eudaimonia, ergon, and erite. These are Greek terms that you should be familiar with. So what are the virtues for Aristotle? Does he provide us with a list? Well, he does to a certain extent. He provides us with virtues of character. Courage and honesty are two of those. But we should be mindful of a, a, another type or kind of virtue, a virtue of intellect, not just a virtue of character like honesty or courage, but a virtue of intellect. And the, the virtue of intellect that Aristotle writes about is called phronesis, which is practical reason or maybe practical wisdom. That's our moral intuition or common sense that guides us. It's a virtue of the mind or intellect. So there's so uh, just focus on that one virtue of intellect. And then here are the virtues of character that Aristotle writes about, which includes courage and honesty. The virtues are in the middle. And then if you have too little or too much, you have uh, an excess or a deficiency. So if you have too much courage then uh, you're foolish. That's the vice. If you have too little, you're a coward. Honesty, uh, being too modest or being a liar or being boastful if you have too much of it. Being generous, that's a virtue for Aristotle. If you're not generous enough, you're stingy. If you're overly generous, then that gets into spending into extravagance. You should be friendly. People should be friendly. That's a virtue. Uh, if you're not friendly, then you're cold or rude. And if you're overly friendly, it can seem disingenuous. You could be overly flattering. You want to have temperance. Uh, otherwise, you might overindulge. So temperance, when you, especially when it comes to short-lived pleasures like food or sleeping um, or um, uh, not avoiding being lazy, you can overindulge in those sorts of things, and then you can just pig out too much. You can oversleep, or you can be overly lazy. But if you um, are too temperate, you know I should note that technically you you can't have too much of a virtue. It's when these character traits um, slide too much into excess or deficiency. Uh, if you never indulge if you uh, live a life completely of self-denial, like um, there are monks that practice, practice extreme asceticism where they just live minimalistically and they live and eat and have no possessions, then uh, you are too inhibited, too limited, and living a life of too much abstinence. Pride or magnanimity 
is a, a, pr a crowning virtue for Aristotle. So there's different ways to interpret this. Uh, magnanimity is probably a term you're not too familiar with. That's when you're being a gracious person. So, um, for instance, if you, um, you know, if you get picked on by someone and then the tables are turned and you have an opportunity to, uh, to pick on them, but you're gracious and you, uh, you, you hold the higher grounds, uh, you could say it's very big of you. That was, um, magnanimous of you and also is interpreted as pride. If you don't have enough of that, you have low self-esteem. And if you uh, have too much self-esteem where it gets unhealthy, that's vanity. Wit is a virtue, which is interesting to think out of all the character traits that are important, Aristotle includes wit. Otherwise, you're boring. Or you're just an idiot. You're a buffoon. You should be gentle or mild. Otherwise, you have no spirit. Or you're just uh, irritable. You should spend according to your means, which is interpreted as magnificence. Otherwise, kind of like being not generous enough, you uh, stingy on your spending or your chintzy, uh, or you, uh, you're vulgar or obscene. Uh, your spending is too much in the case of spending. And you want to have ambition, but not too much, because you can be overly ambitious, which can get you into trouble, or, and you want to avoid a lack of ambition. ambition. How do we develop these virtues? Well, I said they're character traits that um, manifest as habitual action. So the key there is habit. We need to make them habits. So the saying, practice makes perfect, that's very much relevant to developing virtues. It's something that you have to work on. Consider an analogy to talents, like a talent in athletics. So even... If you are Steph Curry or Michael Jordan or LeBron James, you might be born with a certain natural gift, but you got to work on it. So Steph Curry got so good at shooting, maybe because he's got genetics that lend itself to having the right arm snap and jumping, etc. But he had to take shot after shot after shot until it became second nature. So that's the same for Aristotle is... We, we get in these situations where we don't really, we often don't have time to think and it, and our actions just happen. They just, um, it's like automatic. And we also need a guide. We need a mentor to show us the way. So, and to extend the basketball analogy, Curry and Michael Jordan and LeBron James all had mentors. They all had coaches that worked with them and can see their behavior from a, a more neutral or objective vantage point to help them out. Uh, role models. And so the art of emulation. When you emulate someone, you're mimicking or copying them or you're trying to behave like them or live like them. So that's how we develop the virtues. So the role of parents for children is extremely important for Aristotle. Parents have... An essential, an essential role in guiding us to be the sort of adults that we all strive to be. And it doesn't just have to be parents. It can be anyone who's taking care of the children. This could be members of the community, of the village. It can be teachers. It can be coaches. Uh, it can be extended family. It can be aunts and uncles. All these people play a special role in the development in, in us as a person, and Aristotle recognized that this is very important. I want you to consider this biconditional. It's a biconditional because of that IFF, and remember, no, that's not a typo. IFF, for many philosophers, is shorthand for the phrase, if and only if. So the logic of this statement goes both ways. What do I mean by that? I mean that it is claiming that if you are eudaimon, which more or less means happy, like a profound happiness, then you are virtuous. You're required to be virtuous. And it also goes the other direction. If you're virtuous, then you're happy. So consider those two statements, starting with this first one. If you're eudaimon, uh, if, if you're happy, 
then you're virtuous. And if you're virtuous, then you're happy. Now, not all statements like this work or are true. Some of them do. Like, it's water if and only if it's H2O. That goes both ways, right? If it's water, it's got to be H2O. And it also goes the other direction. If it's H2O, then it's got to be water. But it, not always, right? Um, you know, think about shape and circle. If something is a shape, that doesn't guarantee that it's a circle, so it doesn't go that direction. But if something's a circle, it guarantees it's a shape. One more example. Take a member of a team. Um, uh, if you are on the Golden State Warriors, then you're a player in the NBA. So that only goes in one direction, right? We can't put an IFF in between that. It won't work. You're um, a player in the uh, on the Golden State Warriors if and only if you're in the NBA. That's not true. One direction is true, but not both. That's what makes it false. Well, which direction is true? Well, if you are a player for the Golden State Warriors, then yes, you play in the NBA. Assuming we're talking about the team that, um, as of now, um, plays in Oakland, soon to be San Francisco, or already is in San Francisco, and is the professional uh, team and not, you know, like a, um, you know, like a D-League team or something. It goes that direction. But the other direction doesn't work. If you're an NBA player, that doesn't guarantee that you're on the Golden State Warriors. No, not at all. You could be on the Bulls or the Celtics or the Lakers. So now let's consider this one. Do you think happiness guarantees being virtuous? And do you think being virtuous guarantees happiness? So think about what your own answer would be and then try to figure out what Aristotle might say. So which of these do you think is true? Well, Aristotle endorses A, but not B. For Aristotle, there's no shortcuts to happiness. It's a requirement to develop the virtues if you're going to be happy. In other words, virtuosity or being virtuous, being honest, being courageous, being magnanimous, being witty, all of those things are required if you're going to live the good life, if you're going to achieve eudaimonia, if you're going to be happy. But the bad news is just because you develop those virtues, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to be eudaimon, that you're going to be happy. It's possible that because of, say, environmental circumstances beyond your control, you could be a virtuous person, but you're not living the good life. An easy example, take someone who is virtuous, who is honest, who is courageous, who is witty, who is magnanimous, etc., and imprison them. They're a virtuous person, but you think they're going to thrive and flourish and live the good life in prison, in jail. No, probably not. Or put them on a desert island, or her. So Aristotle endorses A, that... If you are you diamond, then you have to be virtuous, but does not endorse B. If you're virtuous, then you are happy or you diamond. And it's a good practice in the logic box to kind of see that this statement is really talking about two directions, two conditional directions, and to try to figure out which of them is right. Now, maybe Aristotle's wrong. Maybe both of them are right, but at least for Aristotle, A works but not B. Philosophers also discuss whether or not there's a unity of the virtues. So, loosely what that means is that there would be a universal set of virtues that all persons, all moral agents, so roughly that's human beings, but you know maybe there are future creatures like a uh, robots or aliens out there that could be moral agents, but um, loosely speaking we're talking about humans. Is there a set of virtues that humans, every human, should pursue? If so, there'd be a unity of the virtues. So one answer is no. And you'd be saying that, no, there's no single virtue or set of virtues that's universal. The problem with that is that if we go too far in that direction, we end up with some sort of unsavory kind of relativism where 
I pursue my virtues, which might be honesty, wit, magnanimity, um, mildness, and then you have your set, and it just varies from person to person or culture to culture or from era to era. That can be dangerous because suppose there were somebody working for the mob and the virtues that they're trying to develop might be very different. They're trying to be cold and calculated and um, be desensitized to um, the horrors that they commit to, to killing and murder. And then when we try to criticize them, they could say, hey, you, we already admitted that there's no universality when we're talking about virtues. You got your set, I got my set. So that's the problem with saying no. So then we might say, well, yeah, okay, we want there to be a unity of the virtues. We have the opposite problem here. Instead of it being too flexible, maybe it's too rigid, right? So for example, if we take Aristotle's list, as the set, the universal set that we should all strive for, some might take issue with some of those virtues on the list. Take wit, for example. Is being witty required to be happy? Well, maybe in some cultures, but I can imagine a culture where um, you know maybe honesty and courage is really important. But I could imagine a culture um, where you know people just humor just isn't a big part of the culture. It's just not important. But people are still happy. You know, maybe there's a very serious kind of group of people. Um, but if we go with B, that's not allowed because there's just one set of virtues. So you might say, well, then why don't we adjust the set? Well, then there might be another counterexample. If you don't include wit, then maybe there's a problem with some other ones. So the compromise is, and this is maybe in the tradition of Aristotle, is avoiding the extremes. So don't go with extreme relativism and don't go with extreme uh, objectivism or absolute universalism. Instead, maybe pick a core set of virtues, kind of like we did when we talked about moral relativism. Uh, we looked at universal rules like uh, be honest, don't harm people for fun, and don't neglect children. And then beyond that, maybe the rules are some flexibility. Maybe same thing with the virtues. Maybe uh, like honesty and, and uh, courage. Those are good candidates for universal virtues. Can you imagine someone flourishing, thriving, living the good life without being honest, without being courageous, and not just in the military sense, but in a kind of sticking to your, having the bravery to stick to your principles and be authentic sense? Um, that seems very difficult. So maybe there's a very short list of universal virtues, and then we can allow some flexibility for the other ones. Okay, that concludes our discussion on Aristotle. Let's continue with this lecture to a topic that has been historically connected to Aristotle's virtue of character, and that is the topic of women in ethics. And there are, um, there are ethics from feminists, and there is a, uh, a movement called ethics of care. Sometimes these theories or, or schools of thought are used interchangeably. Sometimes distinctions are made between them. But the reason why there's a tie to Aristotle is because if you look at the ethical theories that are very prominent, a lot of them are written by men. And what is emphasized by these theories seem to be character traits that often are associated with stereotypes about men. What about character traits that have been associated with women, fairly or not. Like um, being um, very empathetic, or being nurturing, or being partial instead of impartial. We'll, we'll look at uh, these in more, in detail, in more detail. These, these are just examples. Um, those might have been minimized or downplayed by theorists, maybe by accident or maybe overtly, because of some sexism. So in short, the history of moral philosophy has been dominated by men, a lot of them from, uh, from a white, Caucasian, or European background, not all of them. And um, if that's who the authors are, can we really get a full picture of ethics? Or do we need 
uh, diversity in authorship or voices. That's what we're going to talk about now. Well, one issue that comes up right away is, is there a essential difference between men and women? And before we talk about that, we should talk about uh, a difference, if there is any, between gender and biological sex or nature. So some people theorize that there is a difference between gender and biological sex. So uh, biology is something that is um, much more a part of one's nature. So the list we have here are uh, differences between the male and female um, uh, human. So it says here nearly half of adult humans have male genitalia, penises, have chromosomes, XY, have two testicles, Adam's apple, no reproductive capacity, etc. And nearly half of adult humans have female genitalia, have vaginas, have XX chromosomes, have no testy, um, often have reproductive capacity. So that is biology. That seems to be, there are two kind of natural kinds that we find uh, in the human species. And then uh, terms that we use for that, male and female. So those differences, some philosophers argue, are real differences. They're objective differences. Those differences um, are not just made up by, um, by human beings. Uh, they're, they're mind independent. They're, they're, um, the differences are external to um, sociology and to culture. Um, they're not subjective. They're not relative from person to person or culture to culture. Then there are other sorts of differences, the difference between a man and a, and a woman. And here we're talking more about gender. And so um, another popular theory is that gender is distinct from sex and um, is less, if at all, tied to nature, is not biologically determined and has a strong social or cultural component. Some even argue that gender is entirely socially constructed. So that's a common view. Consider the difference between these two magazines. These seem to have very much less to do with biology and much more to do with sociological cultural factors tied to gender. So, um, so, so some argue, looking at these, and there seems to be some just ob um, obvious um, and explicit sexism. Because if you look at the careers, the future of boys, you've got all these really cool things, like being a firefighter or a police officer or being a scientist. And then you've got some stereotypes. Um, boys and men, they like science and they work with hammers and hard objects and trucks and computers and computer science and they can be doctors. You can see a calculator and a, a beaker and a, a satellite. There's none of that in the cover of the girls' magazine. Instead, it's about beauty and objectification and your eyes and your skin and your teeth and your dream hair and... Um, how you can attract boys, and the, the colors are purple uh, and pink, and um, youth and beauty, fashion, being pretty, my first kiss, uh, clothes. Uh, and um, so what message does this send to young people? Uh, yes. Yeah, so... Um, so do a web search for the title here. What's with the X in Latinx? So there's been a recent movement to change the language that we use. 
So especially Spanish speakers, uh, Spanish is gendered, arguably, or just is. And what I mean by that is some words are masculine and some words are feminine. So for example, as you watch the video, uh, a group of um, women who are friends are las amigas, you know, ends in a, a or as. And if it's a group of guys, it's los amigos. So then you have los instead of los, um, or l instead of la. Uh, it ends in os instead of as, or o instead of a. And if you refer to this group of people, right, that share this experience, or, you know, they're all um, Chicana, Chicano, uh, Latino, Latina, instead of the, you know, A or O, a lot of time, if it's a group of where there's uh, a mix in gender, then it is the O or the, um, the OS that um, that's the default. And so in the video, the speaker makes the point that if you have, um, you know, a hundred women, they're all friends. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm here with, uh, with my, my friends, mis amigas. But the, um, the language is set up that if one guy comes in, another, you know, a, a, a man who's a friend with these people, so they got 101 and one's a guy, because it's now technically um, mixed gender, if you refer to the whole group, it would be um, Latinos. It'd be Los Latinos, or it would be um, Los Amigos. And there's something kind of gendered and unfair about this. And so there's a movement to change the language. And instead of having the O or the A or the OS or the AS, why not just an X, which is a, a gender inclusive term as opposed to the, um, the male uh, term for, um, for groups. So instead of, um, you know, we are Latino, we are Latinx. So that's a, a movement to get away from these sorts of directions. So in your discussion boards, you can talk about whether or not you think this is a step in the right direction, or you think this is weird, or you've never heard of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a place for you to chime in. Do we really have a problem here, or are we just focusing on political correctness? Well, historically, there's been a lot of sexism, even from our time-honored philosophers. For example, men and women possess different virtues. Men's virtues fit them for leadership, whereas women's fit them for home and hearth. So hearth is where you used to uh, kind of the stove, wood-burning stove, for example, where you would do the cooking. So a famous social political philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau said that women are not as rational as men and so women are naturally ruled by men. What a sexist awful thing to say. Well that was written by a philosopher who we just studied. That was Aristotle who said that believe it or not. Women lack civil personality and should have no voice in public life. Well that's Immanuel Kant. We looked at his ethics. So you might say, well, let's look at the theory and not the man. The theory could be good, even though the man was sexist. But the question is, if all our authors come from this um, same background, then can our theories be correct? Can they be complete? And you might say, well, the theories in the past or the people in the past, yeah, there was a problem that then, but now we've got much more equality between men and women. Well, look at those. Uh, look at the language uh, in Spanish, for example, in a lot of the Romance languages. It's still gendered. Um, look at the difference in how we treat girls and boys uh, from the magazine covers. And look at the current status of women. So in terms of wages, women, um, there's lots of research uh, about comparing uh, men and women who are doing the same work, the same jobs, and yet there can be a pay gap, a wage gap. So this is from a few years ago that um, you got one, a woman doing a job, a guy's doing the same job, you might think, oh, they should get paid the same. But a lot of times women will pay, be paid less, on average 20% less. Uh, our representative, representatives in government, you know, if, if we really uh, are kind of past the problem of sexism, then you would think that representation in government would not be skewed toward one, um, one group. Well, look at our senators. We got two for each state, 
50 states, it's 100 senators. So ideally, there'd be 50 women senators. Well, um, we have around 17, and that changes with elections, but nowhere near 50. Well, in the House, what percentage? You would hope 50, but again, it's close to 17%. Maybe it's different in uh, the, the governor's mansion. Well, you would expect 25 state governors in an ideal world because we have 50 governors. There's only six, or maybe that's changed, but still um, not anywhere near 25. Maybe uh, the United States has more sex sexism. Well, out of the almost 200 countries, we have 20 world leaders who are women, and that's only about 10%. In business, it's bad. So out of these big companies known as the Fortune 500, only 13 of them. Are women, and you would you would expect two hundred and fifty. So, um, what are the traits that may have been downplayed, or minimized, or ignored in our moral theories? Well, you can look at this graphic, and I've also summarized it um, maybe in a more clear way here. So, on the left, we have traits that are emphasized in many traditional theories of ethics, maybe in Kant's ethics, maybe in Aristotle's ethics, maybe in Mill and Bentham's ethics. And then on the right, we have traits that may have been minimized or downplayed or have been ignored. Um, ethics in the past maybe has overemphasized individuality and autonomy. Well, what about emphasizing relationships and community? Uh, autonomy is good, but what about working together, cooperation? Traditional ethics, like Kant's ethics, says that we should be dispassionate in our judgments, to be fair and neutral, and should we should use reason. Well, that's good, but aren't there times where we should appeal to emotion? And um, when we looked at... Um, we were comparing cognitivism. What about theories that don't stress reason and belief and focus more on emotions? So the views of people like David Hume or A.J. Eyre or Charles Stevenson, where sentiment uh, is important. These views were non-cognitive. Non -cognitive, excuse me. In traditional ethics, we often see procedural principles like the categorical imperative or the principle of utility. That seems to be uh, maybe a good goal, but maybe there's not a one-size-fits-all principle. So, um, other from other uh, vantage points, uh, maybe fe feminist ethics or ethics of care, instead of looking for a one-size-fits-all rule, maybe we should look at traits. So you can see the connection to what Aristotle was doing. Neo-Aristotelians, so neo means new, and Aristotelians means disciples or followers of Aristotle, they are focusing more on what should I, uh, what kind of person should I be instead of what should I do, focusing more on character traits. And some of these feminists uh, who are involved in ethics or people who work in ethics of care, they too are focusing on traits like empathy or nurturing, altruism or caring over procedural principles. These procedural principles are supposed to be universal and exceptionless, especially for Kant. They're absolute, like never lie, ever, 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 even if it's an inquiring murderer. Or we could say um, maybe we should allow some flexibility. J.J. Smart criticized rule utilitarianism if it um, always sticks to the, the set of rules that we select for our rule book that we're guilty of rule worship and we need some flexibility. Casuistry is a fancy philosophical term for judging moral situations on a case-by-case -case basis. Casuistry is case-based reasoning, and sometimes judges do that. They have kind of a general rule, but um, a lot of times they'll, especially when they're doing, um, when they're dulling out sentences, they'll look at the case uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's based on the situation or the context. Traditional ethics says, no, the context is irrelevant. There needs to be, you know, like ly lying doesn't change on the context. It's just a un universally bad thing. So in being impartial, impartiality is stress for traditional ethics. And that's good because we want to be fair, right? In utilitarianism, when we count people's happiness, we don't want to be partial. We want the... Um, 
the pauper or the poor person's happiness to be just as valuable as the prince's happiness. So it's good to be impartial, right? And when you, if you were ever on trial, you would want your judge to be impartial, not biased or, or um, leaning or slanted. But then sometimes we want to be partial. Remember that case when we were talking about utilitarianism where um, the Titanic's going down and you can save uh, your own child or you could save a stranger's child. If we go with utilitarianism, you got to flip a coin. You're not allowed to be partial. But in some cases, at least, maybe not all, but in some, maybe many cases, our common moral intuitions push us toward bias and partiality, especially when, it, especially when it's our loved ones, or our friends involved. In traditional ethics, no one gets special treatment. But in feminist ethics or ethics of care, people can get special treatment. Uh, we protect um, those who are vulnerable, those who are the most um, susceptible to uh, power structures in our society or those with whom we have special ties, familial or friendship. So what do you think? Do we need to, you know, do we need to take into account the things that are on the right side of this list? So think about that. If your answer is yes, then we, then we should move away from traditional ethics because traditional ethics doesn't make room, any room, or at least doesn't make enough room for the things on the right. So that's question one. Should we include things on the right? Um, another question. Are what, are, are, are what you see on the right, does that have some tie or association with women over men? Do you think that women um, have some kind of connection, whether it be biological or cultural, to emphasizing relationships over the individual, emphasizing community over the individual, emphasizing cooperation over autonomy, emphasizing compassion over dispassion, emphasizing uh, nurturing and caring over, um, um, you know, being... Uh, objective and neutral, being partial over impartial. So um, you might say yes, but then the question is, why is that? Is that something that was learned or is that something that is tied to an essential feature of a woman's biology? And then what does woman's biology even make any sense? So maybe we talk about the female biology, right? Because... Um, woman is gender and biology is sex and um, one view is that while there is a, a strong correlation between female humans and people who will be women that it's not a hundred percent and we um, we can see this coming out when we have discussions about the LGBTQ community especially the T members of that community so you could have someone who biologically is female, but their gender is not one of a woman, right? Their gender might be one of a man. Um, yeah, and so uh, we could say so many things about that, about heteronormativity and the rejection of binaries. And when it comes to gender, having just two boxes doesn't make sense. And that gender is a spectrum or it's sloppy and messy. Um, that's a long conversation that we could have. Now, uh, the next question is, what do we want to include in our ethical theory? Setting aside what's at the top of those two uh, categories. Even if we just say, it doesn't matter if you say these are for men or these are for women. Who, who cares about that for the moment? Set that aside. Let's bracket that. Which of these, if you, out of, if you look at all of them, left and right columns, what do we want in our moral theory? Now, some of you might be thinking, I like all of them, which I get because I am attracted um, to all of these in some sense. But uh, here's a big point of this lecture on um, women and ethics is that we have to be very careful here because there are inconsistency issues that will arise if we just circle everything on this list. Why is that? Well, how can you stress, look at the third row, for example, how can you simultaneously stress in a single case dispassion 
and compassion. Those are antonyms. So if you're dispassionate, then by definition, you're not compassionate. And if you're compassionate, then by definition, you're not dispassionate. And then look uh, down in the green. If you are stressing impartiality, then it would be logically inconsistent to stress partiality. So you can't have it both ways. If you're stressing an individual, going back to the top, how can you stress uh, the, the community? It seems like it's one or the other. Autonomy versus cooperation. So there's a, there's a difficulty here. There's a tension and maybe a flat-out logical inconsistency by circling everything. So um, one way to potentially have our cake and eat it too is in some cases we go left side, in some cases we go right side. So we might say, in general, you want to be impartial when you are um, considering the moral worth of the people affected by our actions. You want to be impartial. But in some special cases, we will allow for partiality. So if you are the leader of a nation, you want to be impartial. You don't want to treat any one person or any group. Um, you don't want to give any advantage to any uh, one group over the other for any arbitrary reason. But if you are in a situation where you got to kind of choose your family over a stranger, then maybe we allow for some partiality. Maybe um, we want autonomy in some situations and cooperation in others. Think about your classes, or the work that you do in your classes. You know, a lot of times you'll be taking an exam or writing an essay and you'll do it by yourself, especially the essay in class, right? And sometimes there's group work, group tests, but a lot of tests, it's just you working on your own. But then you could have other cases where you do group work in class. Or in an essay, you cooperate not in the first draft, but you get comments or feedback from somebody. So the way to maybe avoid the logical tension is to not say autonomy and cooperation, for example, in one single case. It's that you look over time at many different circumstances that are um, you know half that are relevant to morality and in some of the circumstances or cases you look at the left side here you go, you focus on individuality or reason or dispassion and in others you uh, do the right that would be great so that solves our logical tension problem but then you someone might say well when do I go left and when do I go right that's a big question. We're not going to answer that here, but it's something to think about. What we will think about now are some examples of some very prominent, uh, very famous, um, shining examples of female ethicists who also happen to be women, I'm assuming. So uh, one of them, some of you might have heard of before, Mary Wollstonecraft, who is an English philosopher who worked in feminist ethics in the 18th century. Carol Gilligan, who um, did some work in moral psychology. So there were psychologists that were writing about um, developments or stages of moral development. And at the top of this pyramid, when you become like morally enlightened, it seemed to be you have... Uh, you have evolved all these things on the left, and it didn't make room for the things on the right. And so Carol Gilligan rejected this kind of male-centered sort of uh, evolution of our moral psychology. And uh, so Lawrence Kohlberg was uh, the psychologist who was promoting that kind of pyramid of moral growth and development. Simone de Beauvoir, a famous... Um, uh, female philosopher who wrote about many topics, including existentialism and feminism. Uh, one of her great works is A Second Sex. Uh, and she famously said that, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, women are made. They uh, One is not born a woman. One is made or learns to be a woman. And so there's a statement there that... Um, womanhood is not an essential feature of um, 
a person and that it there's very much a sociological factor and what it means to be a woman changes and it's it's what is being told to young girls in our magazines for instance in our parenting styles and what we say they should or shouldn't do what they can or can't do right i mean in the night i mean sorry in the 20th century if you um, watch that film hidden figures um during the cold war there was uh during the space race uh, the united states was really trying to develop its program in um, space exploration and um in NASA, right? Uh, there was a lot of work done, and there was a common belief that this was uh, a job for men. And so, um, what it meant to be a woman and what a, a woman couldn't couldn't do is um, was was not objectively set in stone that came down from the heavens or something. And there were some um, prominent mathematicians who were women of color who played an important role in that story, that film. It's a great film. I recommend it. Well done. Got nominated for Best Picture. Philip Afoot is one who repopularized virtue ethics. So she lived mostly in the 20th century. A factoid about Philip Afoot, she was the granddaughter of uh, former President Grover Cleveland. Notice how I, maybe I was a little sexist there by, I have to frame this woman in terms of her relationship to a powerful man. So Kind of interesting how these things slip out even without us noticing. Noticing uh, Judas Jarvis Thompson, when we talked about the uh, the trolley thought experiment and utilitarianism, um, that we credit originally to Philip Foot, but Judith Jarvis Thompson put her own spin on it, and the organ uh, hospital organ donor hospital case. Uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson wrote important versions of that and wrote many really neat and powerful thought experiments. Martha Nussbaum, an American philosopher, she writes about moral psychology and focuses on the emotion. A neo-Kantian, Christine Korsgaard. So all that time we wrote about Kant, there's a, one of the most famous Kant scholars is Christine Korsgaard. And someone who works in feminist and queer theory, very important thinker, Judith Butler, who, um, has made invaluable contributions to uh, to philosophy and has a lot to say about gender, the LGBTQ community, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, the relationship between sex and gender, etc. All right, we're going to wrap things up soon here. Uh, some theorists argue that Feminist ethics or ethics of care might be a good supplement to uh, traditions of the past. So the argument goes like this. The ethical theories of the past, for example, Kant's theory, is incomplete because it was authored only by a man and stresses only um, kind of a male-oriented ethics. But if we include some of the notions from ethics of care or feminist ethics, we it will be better, more complete. Remember... One objection to Kant's ethics is that it's too rigid, too obsessed with universal rules. Well, some of those aspects of feminist ethics allows for more flexibility. Uh, also, Kant's ethics doesn't grant moral agency, doesn't care about enough to some non-human animals, infants, and the mentally disabled. Well, because caring for the most vulnerable is, and protecting them, is emphasized by um, ethics of care, or feminist ethics, um, that is a way to resolve that problem that we saw in Kant. Problems with utilitarianism, maybe this new idea in ethics can help us out. It didn't allow partiality toward loved ones. Well, that's one of the qualities that's stressed. Uh, in this line of thought. Utilitarianism might require helping those that we've never met before. This is a difficult case. Someone like Peter Singer, he would argue that proximity doesn't matter, right? He thinks that we have a duty to people who are dying, especially innocent children, even those ones that we've never met. And there does seem to be something there, but at the same time, maybe 
um, maybe we have more, a stronger moral duty to those who are closer to us in our communities and those that we're related to in our family. Um, so this would kind of weaken that staunch impartiality that utilitarianism seems to require. So if we kind of mix the old with the new, maybe we'll be better off for it. And our theories will be maybe more complete or at least have more diversity in the authorship. Okay, that's going to do it for our discussion of Aristotle and women and ethics. Thanks for listening. See you next time.